Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Today, I'm so excited to talk all about migraine headaches, which are one of the most common symptoms I see in my practice. So let's get started. Okay, so here's an overview of my talk. We're going to talk about what are migraine headaches. We're going to go over what are some of the root causes of migraines. I'm going to go over what are some of the most common food triggers for migraines. I'm going to talk about hormonal triggers in women. I'm going to talk about the gut microbiome and how that can impact migraines. I'm going to describe a key genetic factor that could influence your likelihood of getting migraines. And then I'm going to give you tips on how to prevent migraines. And I'm going to go over the diet and key supplements to help prevent migraines. So what are migraines? So migraines have an enormous variety in how they affect people. So they really vary person to person. They're a complex neurological disease that affects your central nervous system. And it all starts out with a little bit of inflammation. So the inflammation triggers a chemical chain reaction that leads to abnormal brain biochemistry. And the final result is dilation of a blood vessel. So dilation means swelling of a blood vessel. Usually the pain in migraines is one-sided, but it can be two-sided. It's usually described as throbbing, pulsatile or pounding. It can last anywhere from four to 72 hours. And headaches are only one symptom of a migraine. So often people also experience nausea, some people even vomiting. People often also experience sensitivity to light, which we call photophobia, and sensitivity to sound, which we call phonophobia. Some people also get auras. So auras happen in about 20% of people with migraine. So they happen anywhere from 10 to 60 minutes before the onset of the migraine. And they're kind of a warning sign that the migraine is coming. So visual auras can be like flickering lights or lights in a zigzag pattern in your peripheral vision. And sensory auras can be like a tingling sensation or numbness in your body or in your face. If you suffer from more than eight migraines per month, we consider it chronic migraines. So migraines involve abnormal electrical activity in your brain because there's an abnormal flow of brain neurotransmitters, including serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So you may be familiar with serotonin. Serotonin is the happy brain neurotransmitter, and it also plays a role in pain regulation. So people who suffer from migraine actually also more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression because it has something to do with these brain neurotransmitters. So common migraine medications in the tryptan family, such as sumatriptan, they're actually serotonin agonists, meaning they mimic serotonin, and they're thought to interrupt the biochemical mechanism of a migraine. So for some people, they can be very effective. Now, during migraines, people often have other symptoms like fatigue, difficulty thinking, and difficulty speaking clearly. So during a migraine, people often feel that throbbing pain like in their temple or behind their eye. And the reason for this is the migraine is causing inflammation in the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is a sensory nerve and you have one on either side of your face and the branches go above and below your eye as shown in the picture. So that inflammation in the trigeminal nerve is actually what's causing that pain behind your eye. So unfortunately for many people, migraines can be debilitating. It can really affect attendance at work and school. But here's the good news. Migraines can be prevented. And today I'm gonna to give you lots of tips on how to prevent migraines. So it's really important you know your migraine triggers. So migraines are actually really common. A lot of famous people suffered from migraines, such as Thomas Jefferson, Serena Williams, John F. Kennedy, Julius Caesar, Gwen Stefani, Gwyneth Paltrow, Whoopi Goldberg, and even composers Frederick Chopin and Peter Tchaikovsky. So one in 10 Americans or 30 million people in the United States suffer from migraines. And women are actually three times more likely than men to have migraines. And it has to do with the hormonal fluctuations that happen every month. And I'm gonna go over this today. Genetics do play a role. So if your mother or father had migraines, you're also more likely to suffer from migraines. We refer to people who suffer from migraines as migraineurs. So let's go over the common migraine triggers. So everyone has different migraine triggers because the human brain is a complex organ. So stress can be a universal migraine trigger. So that's why it's so important we learn how to manage our stress. Insufficient sleep. So sleep is an important time for your brain because it's a time when your brain is clearing out a lot of toxins. It's an important recovery period for your brain. So if your sleep is disrupted, it can definitely increase the likelihood of getting a migraine. 
Dehydration is another very common cause of migraines. Exposure to strong odors and nauseous smells like cigarette smoke, car exhaust, gasoline, cleaning chemicals, perfumes, or even flowers. Weather changes. So if there's changes in humidity or hot weather or a drop in barometric pressure, like right before rainy weather, sometimes that can trigger migraines. Low blood sugar. So if you skipped a meal or your food is delayed, sometimes that can trigger migraines. So three quarters of people with migraines actually have something called reactive hypoglycemia. So what this means is if they eat a meal that's high in carbs and sugars, their blood sugar goes up, but then it drops too low. So that's why avoiding sugars and high carb meals can actually help reduce migraine frequency. So caffeine, both withdrawal and excess. So if you're someone who has a cup of coffee every morning at 6 a.m. and on the weekend you decide to sleep in until 9 a.m., then your brain may think the caffeine is delayed and sometimes that can trigger a migraine. But it's good to be aware that excess caffeine can also trigger migraines. Alcohol can trigger migraines for a variety of reasons. I'm going to go over that today. Bright lights. So it's really helpful for migraineurs to wear sunglasses. So there's a lot of common food triggers. So I'm gonna go over the main ones today. Allergies, so if you're suffering from nasal allergies or sinus allergies and they're flaring up, sometimes this can trigger migraines. And then hormonal changes in women. So I'm gonna go over this in detail today. So let's go over the common food triggers. So MSG is monosodium glutamate. So it's a flavor enhancer and it's found in a lot of processed foods. Unfortunately, it can be a migraine trigger and I'm gonna go over this in more detail. Nitrates and nitrites are actually found in a lot of processed meats, and sulfites are found in a lot of wines. Tyramine is a compound that's found in aged cheeses, wines, soy sauce, even ripe bananas, and it can trigger migraines for some people. Caffeine, like I mentioned, both withdrawal or excess caffeine can trigger migraines. Chocolate, so this is unfortunate, but for some people, chocolate does trigger migraines. Sugar, because sugar is inflammatory. Among food categories, gluten and dairy are probably the highest culprits for migraines. Part of this is because six to 7% of the US population is thought to have a gluten sensitivity. When they cut out gluten, they see reduction in migraines. And dairy, a lot of people have lactose intolerance and they don't even realize it. So when they eliminate dairy products, their digestion improves and they have less migraines. High histamine foods. So I'm gonna go over this in detail today. And then aspartame. So aspartame is an artificial sweetener that's found in Diet Coke. So these are some foods that have MSG. And so as you can see, they're all processed foods. So MSG actually works as a excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. It can be disguised by other names. So you have to read labels very carefully. It could be hidden as glutamic acid, monopotassium glutamate, calcium glutamate, monoammonium glutamate, magnesium glutamate, or calcium caseinate. So the bottom line is if you avoid processed foods, you won't have to worry about MSG sneaking into your diet. So tyramine is a compound that's found in aged cheeses as well as wines. I've seen a lot of patients who've had significant reduction in migraines after eliminating alcohol and dairy products from their diet. So alcohol, the first problem is it dehydrates your body as well as your brain. So that can trigger migraines. Alcohol also makes you flushed because it dilates blood vessels. And as you may remember, dilation of a blood vessel is part of the pathophysiology of what causes a migraine. Wines also have sulfites and tyramine, as well as other fermentation products, which can trigger inflammation. And these are especially found in red wine, scotch, bourbon, champagne, and beer. The alcohols which have less of these products include vodka, tequila, and white wine. But it may be best to avoid alcohol entirely to see if your migraines improve. Now, the problem with cheese is a lot of people have lactose intolerance and they don't realize it. So the cheese affects their digestion and it causes inflammation. And remember, aged cheeses have tyramines. So it may be worth cutting these out to see if your migraines reduce in frequency. So processed meats like sausages, pepperoni, and hot dogs, these do have nitrates, nitrites, as well as tyramines. And for some people that can trigger migraines. So chocolate, here's the good news. It may not be all chocolate. 
Part of the problem with chocolate is the sugar content, which can be inflammatory. And also a lot of chocolates have milk products, which have lactose that some people can't digest well. But you may tolerate a dark chocolate, something that's 90% chocolate, has few ingredients, and that's dairy-free and soy-free. So they do have such chocolates that only have cocoa butter. I also want to point out in this picture, there's the red heart chocolate, and that probably has red 40, which is an artificial food coloring, and that could be a migraine trigger for some people. Now let's go over a case example. These are all real patients I saw in my practice. Of course, I changed their names, but I wanted to share their cases because they were really remarkable. Here we have John, who's a 33-year-old man with severe frequent migraines for the past five years. They were so bad they would wake him up at night. He had multiple ER visits and a hospitalization for what they call status migraineus, which is when a migraine doesn't abort after several days. While he was in the hospital, they gave him so many cocktails of medications, including IV steroids, but he felt that none of the medications really worked, and he actually felt like they were making him worse. When he was discharged from the hospital, he was on five prescription medications. When I first met him at his initial consultation, he was on baclofen, carbamazepam, tramadol, nortriptyline, and gabapentin. So that's a lot of medication. When I asked him further questions, he mentioned that he suffered from a lot of bloating and that he had always struggled with his weight. So here was a young man with a family and his life was just falling apart. Actually, when I first met him, I was actually a bit nervous. I wasn't sure if I could even help him because he had seen so many neurologists. I wasn't even sure if there was much I could do to help. So I decided to start by just ordering very comprehensive labs. And what I found on the labs is a lot of inflammation. His labs showed that he had elevated liver enzymes. He also had an elevated fasting insulin level, which indicates insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the physiology that can lead to diabetes. He had very low vitamin D. He also had low testosterone and low DHEA, which is the good adrenal hormone, also known as the anti-aging hormone. So I decided to address what I was seeing on the labs, which was a lot of metabolic inflammation. So I put him on a paleo diet. So a paleo diet is when we cut out grains. So we cut out bread, pasta, rice, cereals. And this is a type of diet that's really helpful for insulin resistance in fatty liver. I also suggest he go gluten-free and dairy-free because these are the two most inflammatory triggers for a lot of people. I supplemented his vitamin D quite aggressively so we could get it up quickly. And then I had him take magnesium every night. I'm going to talk a lot more about magnesium today, but magnesium is what I consider the miracle mineral for migraine. So I had him take that every night. I also gave him fish oil, which is omega-3 fatty acids to help reduce inflammation. I gave him supplemental zinc because zinc is an essential trace mineral to help with testosterone production. And then I also prescribed him supplemental DHEA and bioidentical testosterone. Now, as you recall, he mentioned he had a lot of bloating. So I decided to do further testing. So I did a SIBO test. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. It's a big root cause of IBS and bloating. It's basically when you have bacteria in your small intestine that are not supposed to be there and they cause gas and bloating every time you eat. If you'd like to learn more about SIBO in detail, I have a whole video on this on YouTube. You're welcome to check out. So it turned out that John did have SIBO. So I treated him with an herbal protocol using berberine and oregano, which are herbs to kill the bad bacteria in his small intestine. And what I didn't realize about John is that he had tremendous willpower and he followed my recommendations on the diet to the letter and it worked amazing. So when I saw him three months later, his weight was 30 pounds down. His liver enzymes were normal. His fasting insulin was normal. And his DHEA and testosterone were now optimized. And then when I asked him, how are your migraines? He told me ever since we treated the SIBO, I have no more headaches. That was just so astonishing to me. So this was one of the cases that really blew me away because I saw his health transform before my eyes in just three months. And he was actually now down to just one medication. And he continues to follow up and he's doing amazing for the last year. And he's kept up all these healthy lifestyle habits. 
So he's like a different person now and his quality of life has improved dramatically. So this is a diagram just summarizing his case. So he had migraines, but it was in the setting of gut inflammation because he had the SIBO. He had metabolic inflammation from the fatty liver and the insulin resistance. He had the hormonal deficiencies, the low testosterone, the low DHEA, and vitamin deficiencies, low vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, and omega-3 fatty acids. So I wanted to talk a little bit about migraines and histamines. So you may be familiar with histamines. They're what cause allergy symptoms. So antihistamines like Allegra, Zyrtec, and Claritin, they help to reduce histamines in the body and reduce these types of symptoms. Histamines are also found in aged and fermented foods. And for some people, when they eat high histamine foods, they get allergy reactions like rashes and migraines as well. The great news is that there are natural antihistamines like quercetin and vitamin C. So if you take 500 milligrams each before a meal or during a meal, it often helps reduce histamine reactions from a food that's high in histamines. So here's an example of a fermented food. This is sauerkraut and pickles. For a lot of people, sauerkraut is actually a very healthy food. It has lots of good probiotic bacteria. But for someone who is sensitive to histamines, this could be a potential migraine trigger. Same thing with aged vinegar. So here we have balsamic vinegar. So I've had lots of patients tell me when they eat in a restaurant and all they are eating is a salad, but they still get a migraine. So it could be the vinegars. I often recommend patients to use just lemon juice and olive oil to dress their salads instead of vinegars. Soy sauce is another potential migraine trigger because it has tyramines as well as histamines. And soy is another common allergy or sensitivity that a lot of people have. Bone broth, many of you may be familiar that bone broth is great for gut healing, but it does have a lot of histamines. So it's just good to be aware if histamines are a potential migraine trigger so that you can know if you need to avoid it or not. Now let's talk about migraines and hormones. So migraines are actually three times more common in women compared to men. And it's because of the fluctuations in hormones that occur during the month. As you can see from this diagram, estrogen peaks in the first half of the month called the follicular phase and progesterone peaks in the second half of the month called the luteal phase. So I like to check hormone levels on day 21 of the menstrual cycle because that's when progesterone peaks. Some women actually have really high estrogen levels and it's not balanced with progesterone. So we call this estrogen dominance. And this can be a root cause of migraines. Now, menstrual migraines are migraines that occur during the actual menstrual period versus menstrual related migraines are ones that occur during other times of the cycle. For example, some women get migraines close to ovulation when the estrogen peaks. Other people get migraines in the week just before the period when the progesterone levels drop. But the good news is magnesium works wonderfully for menstrual migraines. And the other good news is that when women transition to menopause, a lot of times migraines go away because hormone levels even out. So I have another exciting case example for you. So this is Jane. So Jane is a 37 year old woman who was suffering from very heavy periods and frequent debilitating migraines. She would get aura and phonophobia. So phonophobia means that sounds would really bother her during her migraines. She had bad PMS symptoms. So this means she had anxiety, irritability in the week before her period. She suffered from high blood pressure. So even at such a young age, she was already on blood pressure medication. So when I met her, she was on three migraine medications. She was on sumatriptan injections, which she used as needed, amgalati injections, which are an antibody type migraine treatment, and trokendi, which is topiramate, which is an anti-seizure type medication. So when I checked her day 21 hormones, her estradiol, which is her estrogen, was very high. It was 325. Usually we expect around 150. And her progesterone was low. It was 5. Usually we expect 12 or higher if a woman is ovulating. This is showing that Jane had estrogen dominance. Again, estrogen dominance is when a woman has high estrogen levels. Usually it's because the woman is not clearing the estrogens properly. The estrogen is not balanced with progesterone. Sometimes it's due to recycling of the estrogens from the gut. Alcohol definitely makes it worse because when the liver has to metabolize alcohol, it can't do as good a job metabolizing the estrogens. 
Xenoestrogens can also make this worse. So this is chemical estrogens that are found in personal care products like parabens and also in non-organic dairy and meats. And estrogen dominance is definitely associated with migraine headaches, PMS, as well as mood swings. So I treated Jane with a special supplement called I3C and DIM. I3C stands for indole-3-carbonyl and DIM is diindolylmethane. These compounds are actually naturally occurring in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. So I call it the broccoli pill. One pill is equivalent to like eating 20 pounds of broccoli as far as really metabolizing the estrogens. I also gave her calcium D-glucurate. This is a special form of calcium that prevents estrogen and other toxin recycling from the gut. I gave her magnesium, which again is the miracle mineral for migraines. So I had her take magnesium every night. Magnesium also happens to be great for blood pressure. I balanced her estrogen with bioidentical progesterone. And then I cleaned up her diet. So I had her get rid of all the processed food and I transitioned her to a clean organic whole foods diet. I definitely advised her to avoid alcohol because in women who are estrogen dominant, even one glass of wine can raise their estradiol levels 30%, which is incredible. After three months, Jane came back to see me. And what was amazing is she told me her migraines were now very rare. In fact, she just went off all her migraine medication. She also said her periods were now less heavy. She had less PMS, which was awesome. And her blood pressure was now normalized and she went off her blood pressure medications, which was also amazing. When I rechecked her day 21 hormones, her estradiol came down from 325 to 153, which is perfect. And her progesterone improved from five to 12, which was also perfect. This is a great example of estrogen dominance being the root cause of her migraines. If you'd like to learn more about estrogen dominance, I gave a lecture on this before the pandemic and it was recorded so you can watch it on my YouTube channel. It's titled Hormone Balance. Synthetic hormones can also be a trigger for migraines. Synthetic hormones are found in birth control pills. So the best thing to do is to do a trial off birth control pills to see if the migraines improve. A lot of women are actually put on birth control, not really because they need contraception, but because they have bad menstrual periods, irregular periods, heavy periods. I usually like to help with these symptoms and help regulate periods with bioidentical progesterone. And that seems to work really well. Now, if a woman does need to be on contraception, sometimes a woman will tolerate a lower dose monophasic estrogen birth control pill. What this means is that it's the lowest possible estrogen dose and it's monophasic, meaning the dose of the hormone stays the same week to week. Now, I wanna introduce you to a very unique gene called the MTHFR gene, and it stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, and it's a gene that controls methylation in detox pathways in every cell of your body. The reason I bring it up is the literature shows that if you have a mutation in this gene, specifically the C677T genotype, it is associated with migraines with aura. So you can be tested for this gene. And if you want to learn all about this gene, I have a video on YouTube. But an easier way is to just check your blood level of something called homocysteine. So homocysteine is an inflammatory amino acid. And if you have an issue with methylation, the homocysteine levels will be high. My goal is to get your homocysteine as low as possible with an ideal level being around six. Again, we can easily measure homocysteine on your blood work. And I think of it as an inflammation marker and it's inversely proportional to your B vitamins. We can reduce your homocysteine and help your methylation in your body, which is all your detox pathways, by giving you a methyl B complex to take every day. And by getting that homocysteine down, we're reducing inflammation and it may even help reduce your migraines. These are some of the key lab tests that I like to order on my patients who have migraines. So I always start with a complete blood count and a comprehensive metabolic panel. So I'm looking at the electrolytes, the liver enzymes, definitely measure vitamin D, which is so important. It controls calcium absorption. It controls your hormones. It also affects your mood and your immune system. Homocysteine, like I just mentioned, the HSCRP is the high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and it's a marker of inflammation in your body. Hemoglobin A1C is a marker of your blood sugars for the last three months. And I also like to check a fasting insulin level. 
I like to check the full thyroid panel. So that's TSH, free T4, free T3. And I also like to check the TPO antibody. So TPO antibody is the thyroid peroxidase antibody. And it's a marker of autoimmune thyroid disease called Hashimoto's thyroid disease. The reason I like to check for it is it's so common. And if we find it, we can really improve your health through certain changes in the diet. I definitely like to check female hormones and male hormones. So in women, I check day 21, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA sulfate. And in men, I check testosterone, estradiol, and DHEA sulfate. There are some optional tests that we can also do, but they're not necessary. So RBC magnesium is probably the best way to measure magnesium. It's the amount of magnesium inside the red blood cells. But we often don't really catch magnesium deficiency on a blood test. Pretty much everyone with migraines, I'm going to recommend magnesium across the board. So it's not always a necessary test. CoQ10 is coenzyme Q10. It's an antioxidant and a cofactor for the mitochondria in your cells, which are the energy powerhouses of your cells. So I'm gonna talk about CoQ10 later. It's actually one of the supplements we can use for migraines, but the blood level of CoQ10 is not always covered by insurance. So we do it on a select basis. The tissue transglutaminase IgA is the test for celiac disease. So if a person is having a lot of GI symptoms, it's good to rule out celiac disease because celiac patients do have a higher incidence of migraines and their health improves so dramatically when they cut out gluten from their diet. And then I really like to check the IgE food allergy panel because it really helps me give personalized guidance to the patient on how they should modify their diet. Now, if the patient is having GI symptoms like bloating, I definitely do additional testing. So for bloating, I do the lactulose breath test, which is the test for SIBO. And for all other symptoms, I do a comprehensive stool test so that we can figure out what's going on in the microbiome, because there's so much we can learn about your health by looking at your gut microbiome. If you're interested in learning more about the gut microbiome, I actually gave a lecture on this back in 2019 and it was recorded. You're welcome to check it out on my YouTube channel. So does our gut affect our brain? Absolutely. So scientists are now recognizing something called the gut-brain axis. So a significant portion of your neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, they're actually made in your gut. So that's why the gut is sometimes referred to as the second brain. So patients with IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, they're actually 60% more likely to suffer from migraines. And in my practice, I find that when we heal the gut, we see significant reduction in migraines. This was a review article published in 2020 talking about the gut-brain axis and the relationship with migraines. That's why it's so important we address IBS symptoms. I find that when patients go gluten-free and dairy-free, a lot of times it helps their IBS. And as their IBS improves, their migraines also reduce in frequency. This is also why having good daily bowel movements and daily elimination is so important because that's one of the ways you're getting toxins out of your body. So I always encourage my patients to eat lots of fiber, lots of vegetables to help get good bowel movements every day. The wonderful thing about magnesium is it also helps to promote healthy bowel movements. So if a person has constipation, magnesium can help with that as well. When we do that comprehensive stool test, a lot of times we can find certain infections like H. pylori in the stomach or a parasite. Sometimes we find candida, which is a type of yeast growing in the gut. Sometimes we find inflammation or leaky gut, which is abnormal intestinal permeability. Dysbiosis is when there's an imbalance in the bacterial profile. And sometimes we find something called a high beta glucuronidase. And this can actually cause a lot of recycling of toxins and estrogens from the gut. The good news is whatever we find, it's treatable and it gives us an opportunity to figure out what's going on and then correct that so your health can improve. This was a review article published in 2019 talking about the association of diet and migraines. There's definitely a correlation between diet and migraines. This is the type of diet I recommend to my patients who have migraines. The first thing I recommend is we have to stabilize the blood sugar. So I recommend protein, fat, and fiber at every meal. The meals should really be on time because a drop in blood sugar could potentially trigger a migraine. You want to avoid processed foods because you never know about MSG or other chemicals that could trigger a migraine. 
A lot of times elimination diets can be really helpful. So I like to advise patients on this based on their allergy tests. So I like to do the IgE food allergy test and then give them personalized guidance on trying some elimination and then potentially adding those foods back. The big ones that I've observed are gluten and dairy. As I mentioned, up to six to seven percent of the U.S. population may have a gluten sensitivity. What they notice is when they cut out gluten, they feel better, their health improves, and they have less migraines. Same thing with dairy. A lot of people, again, have lactose intolerance. So when they cut it out, their digestion improves and they have less migraines. Aged cheeses also have a lot of tyramines and that could also be another potential problem with dairy products. We definitely recommend cutting out refined sugar and alcohol because sugar is inflammatory and alcohol, it dehydrates your brain. And a lot of alcohols have the fermentation products like tyramines and sulfites, which can trigger migraines. I only recommend one cup of caffeine daily, preferably in the morning so it doesn't affect your sleep. And finally, drink plenty of water because dehydration is a big cause of migraines. So here's an example of a clean, balanced meal. So this is a wild salmon dinner with pineapple salsa and asparagus and bell pepper stir fry with basmati rice. I love sharing ideas for clean, healthy meals with my patients. So if you're interested, definitely follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Now let's talk about supplements. Some of you may be wondering, are supplements research proven? And the answer is yes. This was a German study published in 2015, looking at 130 patients. And it's a randomized control trial comparing a supplement that had riboflavin, which is B2, magnesium, and CoQ10, and compared it to a placebo. And they found significant improvement in migraine prevention. Migraines can be caused by deficiencies in one or more of these vital nutrients. I think part of the problem is nowadays people are eating diets that are really low in vegetables and high in sugar, so they're not getting these nutrients from their diet. A lot of other people have GI problems, and so they're not absorbing these nutrients from their food. Other people may be on proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole or Prilosec, and that can potentially interfere with the absorption of B vitamins, magnesium, and calcium. The number one supplement that I recommend for migraines is magnesium. So magnesium, again, is the miracle mineral for migraines. Magnesium does so many things in our bodies. It helps to relax muscles, relax blood vessels, and most people are deficient in magnesium, and it's not something we'll pick up on a blood test. Magnesium also helps to regulate nerve cells and it also affects how calcium behaves. It's also involved in serotonin regulation. So it's extremely helpful for migraines and also very helpful for menstrual migraines. It also helps with menstrual cramps as well. The other benefits of magnesium is it can really improve the quality of your sleep if you take it at bedtime, and it helps with muscle recovery. It also helps with anxiety, and it also reduces blood pressure. One more, it also helps with your bowel movements. So if you have any constipation, magnesium will definitely help your bowel movements. The best form of magnesium is a chelated magnesium. So that's a combination of magnesium glycinate, citrate, and taurate, somewhere between 250 to 500 milligrams at bedtime. And you want to adjust it based on your bowel movements. If your stools start to get too loose, you want to pair it with calcium about 250 to 500 milligrams of a chelated calcium. Next, we have CoQ10. Coenzyme Q10 is an antioxidant, and it's a cofactor for the mitochondria in your cells, which are the energy powerhouses of your cells. So there was a randomized control trial by Swiss neurologist, Dr. Peter Sander. He looked at 100 milligrams three times a day and compared it to placebo, and he found it to be really effective in preventing migraines. So you can try CoQ10 at a dose of 300 milligrams per day. Next, we have riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. So there was a study showing that riboflavin at a dose of 400 milligrams a day reduced the incidence of migraines compared to a placebo. And this was a Belgian randomized control trial. Methyl B complex is one of my favorites because it really helps with methylation and those detox pathways. It helps to get your homocysteine level down. It's also great for promoting healthy levels of serotonin in your brain. So it's great for mood. Um, It helps prevent anxiety. So I call it the stress vitamin. 
And it also is great for reducing carb and sugar cravings. So really everyone can benefit from a methyl B complex. Next we have omega-3 fatty acids, which are like fish oil. So fish oil definitely helps to reduce inflammation throughout your body. It's great for your brain and also helps prevent migraines. Vitamin D. So vitamin D is so important. I try to help my patients optimize it to a level of 60 to 80 on their blood work. And finally, we have glutathione. So glutathione is the master antioxidant and detoxifier for your cells, especially for your liver. And it's thought that people who suffer from migraines have sluggish detox pathways. So that's why glutathione can be really helpful. So now let's talk about natural ways to prevent migraines. So the most important is to stabilize the blood sugar. So make sure you have the balanced meals on a schedule. Electrolytes with water can also really help because dehydration is a big cause of migraines. You can make your own electrolyte water by adding some lemon and salt to water, or you can buy electrolyte powder. But just make sure that it has no added sugars or artificial sugars other than stevia. Stress reduction definitely helps prevent migraines, and that's why meditation is so helpful. There was a randomized control trial actually showing that meditation helps reduce migraine frequency and severity. So meditation actually helps lower cortisol, which is the bad stress hormone, and it also helps lower blood pressure as well. Exercise is good for your overall health, but it also helps prevent migraines. So for acupuncture in 2020, Dr. Zhang, a neurologist from Stanford University, and he published a review of the trials and several of the studies revealed that acupuncture was more effective than standard pharmacological treatments for prevention and treatment of migraines. For yoga in 2020, there was the CONTAIN trial, a randomized control trial in New Delhi, India. And it looked at 114 patients and compared to medical therapy, the yoga group showed significant reduction in headache frequency and intensity. Being consistent with your supplements is also really important, especially the magnesium. And consistent sleep is also super important. So if you're working with an acupuncturist, it's good to talk about your specific migraine symptoms because certain migraines affect certain meridians and they may be able to give you a specific treatment. There is one special acupressure point I wanted to talk about. It's called large intestine four. So large intestine four is actually right between your index finger and your thumb. And you can actually give yourself firm pressure at this point. You can do it yourself, or there's also clip-on devices that can give you firm pressure at that point. And it can really help with pain when you're having a migraine. So what are ways that you can abort a migraine if you feel it coming on? So I think a lot of you are already aware that there are medications to abort migraines, like medications in the triptan family, such as sumatriptan or ibuprofen. And although medications can be lifesavers, you may be able to avoid them. So I wanted to give you some tips on natural ways to abort a migraine. So the first thing I recommend is to get a large glass of water and put a big scoop of electrolyte powder and drink that right away. Because again, dehydration is a huge cause of migraines. Now, if you're feeling the pain like in your temple, you can just dab some peppermint oil right on. Peppermint oil was actually studied. Dr. Goebel, a headache and pain specialist in Germany, he did a randomized crossover trial on 32 patients and found that peppermint oil improved cognitive abilities. It had muscle relaxing effects and pain relieving effects. So it can definitely help reduce that discomfort. If you feel that nausea that's coming along with a migraine, the amazing thing is you can also drink peppermint oil. Just put two drops of peppermint oil in a glass of water and sip on that. There was actually a randomized control trial published in gastroenterology in 2020 showing that peppermint oil helps with irritable bowel syndrome as well. Just make sure that it is high grade ingestible peppermint oil. The other nice thing about peppermint oil is it's an incredible defense against all other smells. So if you're someone who's sensitive to perfumes and fragrances and you're walking through a shopping mall, all you have to do is just dab some peppermint oil under your nose or on your temples and it blocks everything out. All you can smell is peppermint. Now, because stress is a big part of triggering migraines, if you can take a little break and do some deep breathing and meditation, that can often help abort the migraine. Finally, caffeine. So if you're due for your morning cup of coffee, go ahead and have that. But just remember, too much caffeine can also trigger migraines. So in summary, it's really important that you know your migraine trigger foods. You want to keep your blood sugar really stable, stay hydrated, manage your stress, get good quality sleep, 
Exercise regularly, take your magnesium every night, and work with your doctor to look for other hormonal or microbiome causes of migraines. So this is what I call an integrative approach. As many of you know, I practice integrative medicine. We're addressing diet and lifestyle. So what I love about this approach is it really gives you a sense of empowerment that you're taking control of your health and you're doing everything possible to be healthy and take control of your migraines. So if you'd like to learn more about migraines, these are two excellent books. The first is The End of Migraines by Dr. Alexander Moksov. The second is The Migraine Brain by Dr. Caroline Bernstein. They're both very well-known neurologists, and they both have practices that are dedicated just to migraines. If you'd like to learn more about my practice, definitely visit my website. You're welcome to subscribe to my email newsletters, and definitely check out my YouTube page and subscribe, and I have videos on all different topics. And then follow me on social media. So I want to thank St. Jude for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture today, and thank you all for joining me. Thank you so much.